Good morning. Uh, my name is Father Tom Neely, and I'm the archivist at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today is Thursday, September the 17th, 2009. And I'm seated here in the Connaughton Boardroom in Schmidt Hall on the Xavier campus. With me is Mr. Michael J. Connaughton, who has graciously agreed to be interviewed this morning for Xavier's archival collection of oral histories. Let me give you a little bit of background on Mr. Connaughton. Mr. Connaughton graduated from Xavier in 1955 with a Bachelor of Science degree. He's a past president of Xavier's Alumni Association, a longtime member of Xavier's Board of Trustees, a past chair of the Board of Trustees, and during the 1990-91 academic year, he served as Xavier's interim president. First of all, Mike, uh, welcome and thank you for your willingness to share with us your reminiscences of Xavier and your many years of association with the school. Thank you for that. And uh, let me begin at the beginning, if I may, by asking you something about uh, your life prior to Xavier. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Detroit. Uh, only lived there for a year, so I don't remember all that. My dad was transferred to Indianapolis, and I grew up in Indianapolis mm -hmm. uh, through high school. Through high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 51, I came to Xavier University uh, to be Right out of high school. Right out of high, high school. school. Tell us about your parents and siblings. Parents were terrific people. They're <laughs> wonderful Irish people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both their parents uh, came from Ireland. and um, I had two siblings, two sisters, mm -hmm. uh, both younger than I. Uh, had a great time growing up, uh, had a great education at Cathedral. We lived on the Near East Side of Indianapolis, <coughs> kind of an Irish-Italian ghetto. Uh, and I knew that early on because the wakes were <laughs> held in the parlor or the <laughs> living room. <laughs> yes, that's right, in the Irish tradition. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Where'd you go to grade school? I went to Little Flower grade school. In Indianapolis. In Indianapolis. East Side. Yep. And then to Cathedral High School. Cathedral High School. Does that still exist today? It does. Uh, it was downtown. It was an all-male school mm -hmm. uh, when I went. Uh, Holy Cross Brothers and Priests uh, owned it and ran it, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, they, after, after I had graduated, um, couldn't support it anymore. <coughs> so a group of lay Catholics took it over. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was a, another a girls' high school Ladywood by name, mm -hmm. uh, that was out uh, just outside of Indianapolis, mm -hmm. actually in the environs. Uh, <coughs> they merged and the cathedral was moved to their campus. I see. Okay. Uh, it is still Cathedral High School, yeah. but now co-ed as a result. As a result of the merger. Right. Yeah. Where and when did you meet your first wife? I met my first wife, Marge, uh, here in Cincinnati. Um, she was a student at University of Cincinnati. She was a bearcat. <laughs> she was a bearcat. <laughs> I'll describe how this marriage was made in heaven. <laughs> I, a dear friend that I played football with, uh, Dutch Schwartz, and his wife Paula. Uh, Marge and Paula were good friends at UC. I wasn't dating anybody, so they arranged a blind date. Uh, the blind date was in the evening after the UCXU football game. Unbelievable. So you would play in a football games. game against UC that afternoon? I did that. Uh, they were more a war than a football game. <laughs> <laughs> Who won? <laughs> we did. Good, good, good. So we meet that evening, uh, and of course I knew she was a UC student. Uh, what I didn't know is she was the UC football cheerleader. Thus, when we were married, it was a marriage made in heaven. It had to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I converted her. <laughs> and you lost Marge? I lost Marge uh, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we were married 40 years. 40 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many children do you have? Five. Five. Uh, four girls and a boy. Uh, I lost a daughter uh, after Marge died almost a year to the day. Uh, which was a real shocker. Uh, we had a wonderful life and a terrific time growing up. Um, 
I traveled a lot initially with the Midland Company, and uh, so Marge, we had three in diapers at the same time. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> She had her hands full. So she had her hands full. Yes, uh, yes. And again, did a tremendous job. Now, the three girls are married and live here in Cincinnati? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. But young Mike is in New York. Mike is in New York. Um, Mike went to St. X High, uh, was a swimmer, uh, was scholarship to Stanford, and swam for Stanford, won the national championship. In swimming? In swimming. He was ranked tenth in the world in the backstroke at one time. Bragging, but that's it's all fact. Right. That's <laughs> it's all right. Fact. That's, I, that's, that's what this is for. <laughs> um, my daughters, my four daughters at the time. Um, I'm a lousy salesperson. Only one of them came here to XU. <laughs> Betsy. Was Betsy. Betsy came. Correct. Yes. yes. The other three went to UC. Oh, <laughs> I have forgiven them, but. But, but it was hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How many grandchildren do you have? I have eight. Uh, eight from uh, my children. And when I remarried um, Nancy, uh, she had three children. Uh, she lost a daughter as well. She lost her husband as well. Uh, they were married 30 years. <coughs> her daughter was killed in an accident. And at the funeral, her husband had a heart attack. Um, he survived for another year and a half. Uh, we did not know each other. Uh, and for three years, as a matter of fact, I was even considering, I had some paperwork uh, going to the seminary. And Is that right? Yes. Study for uh, the diaconate, priesthood? Yeah, and then hopefully the priesthood. I know. Yeah. Uh, that got canceled when I met Nance. <laughs> <laughs> How did that God works in wonderful ways. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. God had his own plans here. Yeah. Yeah. How did you meet Nancy? How did that come about? Again, that's a blind date situation, but a dear friend, Joe Rippey Sr., mm -hmm. uh, was her uncle uh, by marriage. And I had known him forever. I'd done business with him. He was president of a bank in, uh, here in town. So he insisted that you know we have dinner. So the four of us had dinner, and uh, it worked very nicely. And God took very over nicely. From there. <laughs> That's right. Wonderful. <laughs> That's yeah. right. And you were married how many years ago then was that? Uh, just over 11 years. 11 years. We'd been married 81 years. Mm -hmm. I was married Two of you combined. 40, she was married 30, and now we've been married 11. 11, yeah. <laughs> Who performed the ceremony? Uh, Father Jim Hoff. Father Jim Hoff. My dear brother. My dear brother and very close friend. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where did the wedding take place? Was it here on your uh, in, in my par no, in in, your parish? No, in our parish, oh, Christ yeah. the King. Christ the King. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And I understand that both you and Father Hoff wept through the whole ceremony. Well, that's it, an exaggeration. We were, yeah, we we were very concerned because <laughs> uh, Father Hoff Jim was not Irish, but boy, he sure acted like he was Irish. <laughs> he had the same weepy eyes that I did. Well, yes. And so he was concerned. And, I was concerned that there'd be some tears shed, uh, and so was Nancy. So before the wedding, Nancy gave us each a gift, and we opened them, and we each got a linen handkerchief from from Nancy, <laughs> from Nancy, <laughs> with our initials on it. And she said she'd rather give us give us that than carry a box of Kleenex during the ceremony. So. It would look a little tacky. <laughs> yeah. 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 So his approach to uh, to that situation was to. Uh, kind of roast us mm -hmm. in the homily, mm -hmm. which was just wonderful. Fit the occasion, yeah. yeah. You also served in the military at one point. I uh, was commissioned in the Marine Corps mm -hmm. after graduation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> I spent my time at Quantico. Mm -hmm. um, I played football for Quantico. You played football for Quantico <laughs> right. against Xavier? Against Xavier. We played, I played here at Xavier for four years, uh -huh. uh, and we played Quantico every year. And I think that was part of the, the recruiting effort uh, by the Marine Corps to uh, find uh, college football players to go through the program. Mm -hmm. Is it true you got yourself in trouble with the Dean, Father Paul O'Connor, over the... the uh, Dear Father O'Connor, yes. He was Dean of Men. <laughs> and uh, back when I was here initially, ROTC was mandatory for two years. <coughs> 
you could opt to sign for the next two years and then commissioned in, in the Army after that. Uh, my dear friend from Indianapolis, who I went from kindergarten through the Marine Corps with, really, um, we played ball together, Indianapolis and here. Uh, if we had not gotten uh, football scholarships, uh, we were going to join the Marine Corps. So we find out that the, that the Corps has this PLC program, Platoon Leaders Corps. We go downtown to check it out, <coughs> and this is what we always wanted to do anyway. Now you already Marine. saved your students at this time? We were Xavier students, and we'd already signed for the next two years of ROTC. ROTC here at Xavier, okay. So we get a call from Father O'Connor one day, and he asked us to come to his office, and when we went in his office, the colonel in charge of ROTC here was sitting there. And Father O'Connor proceeds to tell us that <coughs> we were in violation of some military code because we had signed for two commissions. <coughs> and then the, the colonel wanted to say something to us, so he, he gave us a little shot. And then Father says, uh, I've talked to the colonel, and uh, he's not going to make an issue of this. So he'll give you a choice. Uh, so Charlie and I looked at each other and said, you know, we prefer the Marine Corps. And the colonel gave us another shot, and he left, and we were leaving Father's office. And he said, I, can, I want to talk to you. So we walked back in front of his desk, and he says, looks up and says, you made the right choice. <laughs> that's course, because he was a Navy chaplain. That's right. He was a Navy chaplain. And he chaplain. was on the Missouri when the Japanese peace treaty was signed. Yes, he witnessed the signing of that peace treaty. And he had a pen in his office. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. But, so he was siding with the Marine Corps over yes, the Yes, he was. <laughs> Tell us about your professional career uh, and the job that you've held. Um, when I got out of the Marine Corps, <coughs> it was in 56, I was in for three years. I got out about a year early uh, because I, <coughs> I severed the cruciate ligaments in the knee and, and so I was discharged early. Um, I obviously came back to Cincinnati. My major was political science and I wanted to pursue that career, law, uh, but I really wanted to get involved in business. So I talked to a neighbor who happened to be a treasurer of Kroger, and he suggested that one way to really get your feet wet is go to work for a CPA firm if you could, uh, which I did. Stan Hittner and company by name was a regional firm, sold plants, um, recognized that <coughs> I didn't have the formal education, accounting, and finance courses. So <coughs> I, too, went to UC. <laughs> I went to UC at night to pick up some courses, business courses. Business courses. Um, from there, I had an opportunity to uh, become the uh, controller financial officer for aluminum products manufacturer out in Iowa. Mm -hmm. I did that. We were out there for about three years. I was going to law school at the same time I was working for the CPA firm. This opportunity in Iowa, I, after two years of law school, I, I made that move, and so I didn't pursue it after that. Wasn't Father Patrick Ratterman involved in that in some way? Father Ratterman, uh, <coughs> the gentleman that owned the company that I went to work for in Iowa, and it was an aluminum extrusion company that made doors and windows for Sears, really, biggest customer. Um, <coughs> but Paul Maloney, it was a Maloney company, lived in Cleveland and operated it out of Cleveland and actually was, was in Ohio initially and the union wanted to organize him. <coughs> he said, um, if they organize me, I'm moving. Uh, he's a great Irishman too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they did and he did. So he moved it to Iowa, moved a lot of the manufacturing people out there, management, couldn't find a, a financial guy uh, Father Ratterman's brother, George, was a quarterback for the Cleveland Browns at the time. Yes. Paul Maloney knew Paul Brown really well. And through conversation, uh, I guess George talked to Father Pat, mm -hmm. said they were looking for a financial guy, and he called me and said, would you be interested? That's how I got out there. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. And Father Ratterman was Dean of Men at that time. He was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And then after that, you came back to Cincinnati after a few years? Sears ago? bought the company out, and I, I opted to, to leave at that time. I came back to Cincinnati. This was 1961. 
and I joined, it was Midland Guardian at the time, <coughs> which is now the Midland Company. Uh, it was a good sized finance company, but it was privately held. Uh, and they decided in 61 to take it public, which I think gave me the opportunity to join them. Uh, I joined them as controller and then treasurer and then chief financial officer, and then I was president for 10 years, vice chairman before I retired. Mm -hmm. And when did you retire then? Uh, I'm still not retired. Still not retired? <laughs> oh, because I know you go 76, to 76, I'm together. still going strong. Yeah. Um, we, we sold, Midland sold, and I was a director of the company. We sold the company uh, two plus years ago to a company, uh, Munich Re, uh, out of Germany, which is the largest reinsurance company in the world. Um, and the board was dissolved at that time. I had been retired maybe three years. Uh, they invited me to stay on as a consultant, so that's what I say, I'm still involved. I still have my office, I go out there every day. And Good, and keeping yourself uh, busy. Absolutely, uh, if I'm not out there, I'm here. Here, yeah, that's probably <laughs> right, either on the Xavier campus yeah, or the Midland right. campus, yeah. Tell us now, let me talk about your association with Xavier. Um, uh, first of all, how is it that you came to Xavier? Uh, I, I presume it was the football scholarship. It was a football scholarship. But how did that come about? Well, we had, back in those days, uh, when you were recruited, you went to the various campuses and uh, spent three, four days, uh, suited up, practiced, you know. Actually, can't do that today. Right, right. So we had, we had a number of opportunities. Uh, Holy Cross priests and brothers had taught me from Notre Dame, uh, had an opportunity at Notre Dame. Uh, that scholarship for, was for a year at a time. Uh, they didn't want to take my chances. My dad didn't want me to take my chances. <laughs> uh, but I had Indiana, Purdue, Miami, Florida, and, and my dad was a Jesuit educated, uh, Ignatius High School in, in Cleveland, and then John Carroll after that. Oh, yes. Your dad was a Carroll graduate. Yes. And uh, he let me make the choice. And I came over here and, and just loved the place. Uh, Ed Kleska was a football coach. Who was the uh, Dean of Admissions at that time? Uh, Father Nieporty, as I recall. Father Victor Nieporty, yes. Right, uh, right. Whom you got to know very well and worked got, with. Got to know very well. As well. Yes, yeah. and my dad uh, yeah. really liked him and appreciated him. Yeah. Now, you majored, you said, in political science. Right. With a minor, maybe, in, in philosophy. In philosophy, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, where did you live on campus? Wonderful place, uh -huh. the barracks. The barracks. <laughs> the old army barracks. The old were, army barracks, yes. We're located where uh, Alter Hall and the library uh -huh. are now. There was a Herald Avenue that ran through there. That's Herald Avenue, which is now the which academic mall. Which is now mall. the academic mall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of them were there along that stretch? Much better. Probably, uh, I lived in barracks 10, but I don't think there were 10 of them. Mm -hmm. And there were <coughs> two of them were for uh, families uh, at the time, married. veteran married people, uh -huh. that were converted into a suite. So my senior year, there were six of us that played ball, mm -hmm. lived in, in one of those. Mm -hmm. How <laughs> was the life in that barracks? Oh, fantastic. You loved it, though. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It. What did your family think about it? Well, <laughs> My mom and dad always were at the football games, or, or they played basketball and baseball and all that good stuff uh, in high school, box, golden gloves. But so when I came here, and I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, play varsity my freshman year. So they came to the first game, and my mom, after the game, my mom said, uh, you know, I'd like to see where you live. And I said, ah, oh, no, you know, eat them. <laughs> <laughs> she, no. <laughs> she said, oh, come on. So I took her over to the barracks. Well, when she saw that, she said, you're not staying here. <laughs> <laughs> of course I did. Of course you did, and you stayed there before. <laughs> had a wonderful time. Yeah. You, and and not, if I'm not mistaken, in those days, you lived over here, of course, as you said. But the meals were served on the other side of campus. On the other side. I guess red that would have been the old Avondale Athletic Club. It was. It was their clubhouse. Which is where the Joseph building is today. 
Right. That means three times a day you went down in the valley and up the other hill. Kept you, you in shape. Kept you, kept you in shape. Yeah. If football did <laughs> that's right. that, that walk back and that's forth, right. very good. Yeah. <laughs> Who are some of the memorable people that you remember from your days at David? Uh, okay. Apart from football now. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> certainly Father O'Connor. Father Paul O'Connor. Father McGuire was president Father while James I was McGuire, in school. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And Father O'Connor succeeded him. But, uh, oh gosh, Father O'Connor, Father John Wenzel. Father John Wenzel. He was a close friend. In fact, he officiated at my marriage to Marge. Uh, he was also in charge of the Sodality at that time. He was, was and I was a Sodality member. I remember the Sodality right. of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And it was a very strong, I think, on all Jesuit campuses. That's right. That was a very, very strong, and we, we developed that and, and emphasized it a great deal. Right. Yeah. Right. And growth in personal holiness as well as apostolic outreach at the sure. same time. Yeah. Yeah. Even beyond, uh, after Marge and I were married, uh, we stayed in touch uh, with Father Wenzel. He became uh, director of the Milford Retreat Center and he was a great cook. And so we would go out and with Father Lips and Father Wenzel. Father Lewis Lips, sure. And Father Lewis Lips. Yes. And Marge and I would play bridge. And for the ones little John would cook us dinner. Uh huh. So we were in touch right up until his passing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Any teachers stood out? I remember Father McComiskey well. James McComiskey. Right. What did he, uh, philosophy department? Yes. Uh, in fact, my freshman year, uh, being fortunate enough to play varsity football, I had to have my classes arranged uh -huh. differently than a typical fresh freshman. So I took logic. Uh, my freshman year, um, and it probably was, it should have been a junior class, maybe a sophomore class. So I'm in Father McComiskey's class, Logic, and uh, you know, I'm 17 to 18, and he calls on me in class one day, and he says, Astute Connaughton, and I thought, well, you son of a gun, <laughs> what do you call <laughs> So I go back to the, <laughs> to the barracks afterwards. I get a dictionary and I look it up, astute. I thought, whoo, that isn't bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real compliment, yeah. So, so I use the word often now. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of your active vocabulary. That's right. Astute. Thanks to Father yeah. yeah. Were your grades uniformly good? I, would, I got good grades, mm -hmm. yes. I uh, had four years of Latin in high school and uh, it required the two years of a foreign language here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I arrived on campus, I chose Spanish. And I had a dear Jesuit, Father Usher. John Usher, yes. Was our Spanish teacher. Harper's Spanish for years. Yes, yes. yeah. And he, uh, he loved football. And he'd stand in the turret in the building when we were playing at home, and he'd wave at us after we'd, we'd go to the grotto first before we went over and then coming back, and he'd the uh, turret in right Eagle here. Hall? Right outside. Oh, okay. Outside right. of alumni. Uh, outside of alumni. Yeah. Yeah. He was up there in that turret. Yeah, right. Uh, as you were down in the shrine just below. Right. Okay. Uh, and I said alumni, but it's now Edgecliff. It's Edgecliff now. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It was alumni yeah, back then. Yeah. Anyway, I had Father Usher for Spanish. Um, you know, he, he was inclined towards football players, I think. So I got two Bs first two semesters. Second year I come back. Class and Senior de Guzman starts speaking Spanish. And I wasn't quite up to that. <laughs> my, my buddy Charlie Kirkhoff and I. <laughs> so he, he gave us a high school Spanish workbook and we sat up in front and while he was doing the classwork uh, we were filling out the book. And uh, every once in a while, he'd say, "El football players," and everybody would laugh. And I said, I said that Charlie, he is referring to the two of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the only D's I ever got in my life, but I got, almost had to threaten to get them. I got, I got a, two D's those two semesters, mm -hmm. but but I, so I succeeded. The, the only blots on the assessment <laughs> the only, are those right. two D's. Is right. right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the football. You played for four years. Mm -hmm. Played as a freshman. That was rather unusual in those days, wasn't it? Yeah, I think played. there were four of us that uh -huh. that you know qualified, if you will. 
In your four years, how did the team do? We did very well. Early on, we did quite well. I, as I recall, we were undefeated one year at one tie. Yes, I think that um, my memory serves correctly. The year would have been 50, and January 51, we played in the salad bowl. Uh, that was before you came. 50, we played in the salad Down bowl. Uh -huh. 51, I. And then you came in 51. Right, right. Well, we were undefeated in 51, weren't we? Yes. Exactly. We had that one tie. The one tie. Yeah. And you played with that team. I did. Who tied us? Who was the one? It was Camp Lejeune Marines. Okay. And we played there. And we were ahead seven to nothing. And the clock was running out. And all of a sudden, the clock malfunctioned. So, and of course, they controlled the clock. <coughs> so we continued to play until they scored and tied us. <laughs> so I think we really were totally undefeated. Un totally undefeated. Yeah. Is that the only year the football team won undefeated? Yes. I think it is, but I'm not. I, I believe I so. Yes. I Going way back, I used to play the Haskell Indians and those folks, and I, I don't know off the top what their records were back then. Where did Zay play its home games? Uh, Cochran Field, Cochran Field. Oh. which is now a soccer field. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a big, uh, quite a, si a large stadium. It was. Yeah. It was. I Press box, the whole thing. stadiums in the state of Ohio. It might have been at the time. Built in the, in the 20s. Yeah. And it's where the soccer field presently is, along Victory Parkway. There. Right. Yeah. And the, uh, the stadium itself mm -hmm. was demolished. And, uh, yeah, that was torn down by yeah. Father Delio's residency, I think. Yes. Around, around that time. Yeah. What teams did you play? Well, we always played the Cornico Marines, <laughs> like mm -hmm. the opening game. Mm -hmm. um, but we played uh, the wonderful traditional games with UC, UC. Miami, mm -hmm. Dayton. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the away, a couple of the away games. We played Boston College and Villanova in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we had we had good teams. Good games. And what position did you play? I played a tackle. Tackle. Offense or defense? Well, back in those days, uh, they didn't start platooning yet, so I went both ways. Uh, so you played both ways. I've heard that Miami would never come down here to play us. Is that true? There was, yes, there was something to do with uh, the league that they were in and UC. So as I understood it, uh, they weren't permitted to do so. So we went to Miami. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, Kind of a funny story. We'd, we'd go uh, in, in the morning, Saturday morning, drive out and uh, make a visit at Little Flower Parish. And there was a restaurant right across the Phoenician Inn or whatever. We'd take school buses back in those days. And so we're driving out. And as you approach Oxford, there's a hill. Uh, and this particular school bus couldn't make it up the hill. It, would, it was still moving, but it wasn't going to be successful. You were not going to get into Oxford on No, with so they got us all off the bus, and the bus got to the top of the hill, and we walked up and got back on. Back on. <laughs> I went into the game. Yeah. Yeah. Was football as big a deal then at Xavier as base, uh, basketball is today? You know, it was. Uh, obviously, different times. Uh, basketball nationally has really gained a lot of prominence. Uh, the NIT was the, the tournament for basketball back in those days. Mm -hmm. We won the NIT in 1958. Uh, then the NC2As took over and the March Madness and all that good stuff. And in those days, NIT was a more prestigious tournament than the NC2A. It was. Yeah, at the time it was. But football uh, didn't have that structure back then. They have the BCS now, which is so different, it, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But in this area, football was was very popular, very strong. Uh, UC was an excellent team. <coughs> uh, preempted their basketball program mm -hmm. until Oscar Robertson arrived, and uh, the basketball took over for in the UC. Early 60s, I guess. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But uh, the student body and the alumni, and I can I'm speaking for Xavier now, were really into football. Uh, really followed it uh, strongly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, so I'd say comparably, yes. It, it, in those days, it was it was strength 
and our wonderful basketball program today is. I want to talk about Xavier's dropping football, Mike. But before I get to that, I, I, want to, I know that in 1972, you became a member of the Board of Trustees of the university uh, at that point. Um, I want to talk about that a bit, because that was a rather important year in the history of the Board of Trustees. The trustees up to that point were all Jesuits. And so the, we were the first lay, lay board members. Um, I was in fast company. I mean, there were about and, six of you came on the board. There were six, six laymen at that time. And tremendous people, tremendous. Do you remember guys. who they were? Do you name some of them? Uh, Bill Williams, certainly. Bill Williams, who just died. Who just passed he's away at 93. Yeah, he was in his 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bill Rowe, who was the CEO of Fifth Third Bank then. Uh, do, 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 do. Help me. Was you. Harry Gilligan one of them? Harry Gilligan. Yeah, the yes. father of John. Gilligan, father of Harry and, of, and of John. Yourself. And if I remember, Fletcher Nice was in that group. Yes. Which is interesting because Fletcher Nice was not only not Jesuit, he was not Catholic. Yeah, right. He um, always boasted the fact that he was Huguenot French. Mm -hmm. Very, very fine man. Yes, he was. I think maybe chairman of the board. And then the following year, the board confronted this issue of dropping football. Right. You were on the board at the time. I was on the board. And you want to I, tell I, us that story? Well, I, I, and I chaired $1,000 the year prior and that year, uh, the football program had. <coughs> and um, so I chaired a committee that studied uh, the situation, determined that the $250,000 loss w was the amount of scholarships given. Um, conclusion uh, that I reported at that board meeting was that uh, we should retain football but drop it down to the division two or three level non-scholarship. Um, that wasn't accepted. Where did that meeting take place? Well, it's the only meeting uh, since 1972 that was not on campus and it was down in the WLW boardroom. Uh, what happened at W.O.W. boardroom? Uh, Gentleman Murphy was on the board. All right, okay. He did that. Yeah, okay. Now, this is uh, my suspicion, and I'll take full responsibility for this, but it was the only, only meeting away from the campus. The issue of football was, was being discussed, and I made the report, and uh, there wasn't much discussion on that. Uh, Father O'Callaghan was on the board, and he made a motion to drop football. And immediately, Father Ranke seconded the motion. Uh, there wasn't much discussion after that, uh, except for me, frankly, saying, oh, wait a minute, let's, let's rethink this. Um, the vote was taken, and there were three that voted to retain it, and the rest voted to drop it. To drop it completely. Yeah, Father O'Connor, Father Mulligan, and myself voted to retain it. After the meeting was over, the doors opened, and the TV cameras came in. That's why I think this was a, <laughs> a setup. Uh, it was very disappointing. And, uh, were there repercussions? There were, uh, you know, monetarily, substantially, initially. Um, time heals all, and uh, we're, we're pretty much over that. We've started a new program here. This will be the fourth year. We have club football, and that's been very successful. Yeah, the team's done rather well. I think they were we formed a conference, and mm -hmm. <coughs> we formed a conference uh, two years ago and won the conference both years now. Mm -hmm. We have uh, eight teams we play, and uh, it's it's the real thing. I did, they've got better uniforms than I had when <laughs> I played. <laughs> Uh, the only thing different about it is they play 15-minute quarters instead of 20. Mm -hmm. So your feelings on the issue really haven't changed over the years. You think the proposal you made to retain football at a non-scholarship level would have been the right decision going back to 70 years. I sure do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. When did you become chair of the Board of Trustees? Oh, not offhand. Mm -hmm. I, I was chair for 18 years. Chair for 18 years. Yeah. Uh, when I left that position, I'm still on the board, uh, 
Joe Pickler, terrific guy, was CEO of Kroger at the time. And presently chairman of the board. Isn't he? Until <coughs> next week. Uh, so if we work backwards, he's been chairman of the board for five years. And so subtract five from nine is four, so it would have been 2004 that uh, I was no longer chair. Bob Kohlhepp is going to become chair now next week, and uh, Bob's a terrific board meeting next uh, Friday, Next Thursday and Friday. Thursday mm -hmm. and Friday, yes. Yeah. How has the function, the size, the makeup, and the procedures of the Board of Trustees changed in your years? Obviously, it's much larger, uh, now predominantly lay. There are some Jesuits on the board. But over and above that, how has it changed? Um, the uh, structure of meetings certainly have changed. We have committees of the board, uh, which are very effective and work very hard uh, early on. Uh, those committees would report at the board meeting, <coughs> each board meeting, uh, each committee would report. That took up most of the, most of the time. And we recognized with, as we grew the board numbers, uh, there's so much talent there. We, we had to have more input at the meetings. So uh, it's been restructured over time. Uh, Father Mike Graham uh, initiated re this when he arrived, and I think he's been president for eight years. Um, and now we have committee reports uh, once a year or more if necessary. Uh, <coughs> and they report uh, particular to the time of the, of the school year, finance reports when the budget time is, is there, for example. Uh, and now we have really interactive opportunity mm -hmm. at board meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For more discussion, right. more input. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll feature some part of the university uh, in a presentation mm -hmm. uh, at board meetings. I think there are probably some people who don't realize the Board of Trustees really runs the university. There are those who think the Jesuits do, but in fact, the power is really with the Board of Trustees. Yeah, t technically, legally, uh, the Board of Trustees owns the university. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the Jesuits, God love them, uh, they, they make it all happen. Yeah, and and they're so very influential, <laughs> too. <laughs> and we, um, by numbers, um, it's entirely different now. Mm -hmm. There certainly weren't as aren't as many Jesuits as when I attended. But we formed a committee of the board, which was terribly important, and it was under Father Jim Hoff's watch, uh, a Jesuit identity committee. Oh, there's a committee just on Jesuit identity. Just on Jesuit identity. When we bring new board members on, uh, part of that uh, obligation they have coming on is to serve two years on the Jesuit identity committee. Every new member of the board? Excuse me. Um, and that's terribly important because, and, and you know, all our board board members aren't all Catholic. Mm -hmm. point. They, oh yes. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we can. Uh, the governor. Yeah, the governor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But uh, during your many years on the board, I'm, of course, there are many important decisions were made. Um, what would you pick, select, or pick out as? a couple of the most important decisions. Surely dropping a football would have been right up there among the most significant. That was major. Uh -huh. Anything else that, that stands out in your mind? Well, I think Lehman on the board was Yes, terrible. moving them, yes, that was very significant, yes. Yeah. And the structuring, restructuring of the board itself over the years, I'm sure that. Uh, That's right. Yes, has been very, very important. And the, um, the development effort, the fundraising effort. To oh, yes. You know, it, it's easy to remember this, but in 1983, our endowment was 8.3 million. Yes. Uh, it exceeded 100 million until the market problem mm -hmm. uh, dropped below, but it's about back there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your long tenure, I'm sure you've sat on the board with some distinguished people, both Jesuits and lay. Would you want to single out a few people that? Uh, 
really stood out for their contributions to the union? Well, from the present board, uh, it's hard to single any one out mm -hmm. because they're all they're all, all terrific people. But you know, Joe Pickler, Bob Colehep, um, going back, John Pepper. John Pepper, who was CEO he of Parker and Gamble, of Parker and Gamble yes. and yes. he was my vice chair for a period of time. Was he? Uh -huh. Yes. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. A. G. Lafley, mm -hmm. who uh, was on the board, he is not now. He mm -hmm. is presently. I mm -hmm. think he just is in the process of stepping down, yeah. but mm -hmm. he was uh, mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble's CEO. Mm -hmm. And I know that Ralph Corbett, the Cincinnati Ralph philanthropist, Corbett. was on the board. Right. And I know he was very, very helpful with Father Mulligan yes, he was. on several occasions. Yeah. Yes. Very, very good. Harry Gilligan was on the board. Was his son, John Gilligan, ever on the board? No, he was not. John Gilligan uh, had a distinguished career in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And when he came out, he, one of his first jobs was a professor here yeah. at Xavier. Mm -hmm. He taught freshman English. Mm -hmm. uh, freshman English was taught on Saturday mornings. That's interesting. Well, it was a discipline. Uh -huh. <laughs> he had to get out of bed on Saturday get out of bed. as a freshman <laughs> <laughs> and get used to it. <laughs> the diagramming sentences and everything else involved in English composition. Yeah. So, and I had him. And as I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to play varsity football. And so, you know, there were times on Saturday mornings when I was elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, one of those times, he had a, a test, a quiz. And I obviously <coughs> wasn't there to take it. Came back and asked if I could make it up. And he said, no, you got a zero. <laughs> and I, it was very upsetting. And so I had a little few conversations with him. I got a C in that class. I could have gotten a B, but. <laughs> yeah, but having <laughs> gotten a zero that. in that quiz didn't yeah, help. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He's a very bright guy. Ended up governor of the state of Ohio. Yeah, was Cincinnati, on Cincinnati Council for a right. number of years, was governor. His daughter is now, Catherine Sebelius, Sebelius is now in the Obama administration. She's the head of health. Education and welfare. welfare. That's right. On the board. Right. And, and John is still active in Cincinnati affairs, really. He is. Yes, he's. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's no spring chicken, as I am not either. But um, he, a few years ago, thought the uh, public school board, public school system, mm -hmm. wasn't being run exactly right, and, and it wasn't. So he ran for the school board. Mm -hmm. And was elected. As a man in his 70s, maybe even early 80s. Yeah, early 80s. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And did really wonderful things. Yes. I think he served two terms and opted not to repeat. Mm -hmm. And from everything I've heard, an excellent teacher. Very he much could so. have pursued an academic career and been a first class right. teacher from everything. After his think. governorship, I think right after he went to Notre Dame, mm -hmm. as a chair that he occupied and taught. Mm -hmm. He also taught at UC for a while. Mm -hmm. One year, he gave the principal address at the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick Banquet. Uh, and it's the finest after dinner speech I've ever heard. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, I wrote to him. He was at Notre Dame. And I asked him for a copy of it. He wrote back and said, I'm sorry I had lived the whole thing. Oh, was that right? I thought, mine. And it was just perfectly delivered and yeah. just, just very clever. It just it was an excellent address. That's true. Down with the name. In 1990, Mike, you became interim president of Xavier for mm -hmm. about maybe 10 months or so there. Would that be about right? Right. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Uh, Father DiIulio had an opportunity to go he to He was Marquette. president at the He was time. president at the yeah. time. <clears throat> to go to Marquette as president. Um, and it was, it, was, it was quick. It was sudden. Uh, thus, we had not had, had a search committee. Uh, hadn't pursued anybody. Um, so they asked, the board asked if I would serve as the interim president, mm -hmm. uh, which I did. I'll tell you the story, but you can probably cut it. Uh, I said, let me talk to Marge. And so I went home and, and uh, Marge said to me, uh, well, you know, the Jesuits take the vow of pov poverty, chastity, and obedience. I said, yeah. She said, are you going to take the vow of chastity? <laughs> and I said, only if you take the vow of poverty. 
There were no vows taken. No vows were taken. <laughs> so I did serve during that period of time. Mm -hmm. It was very exciting. I was president of, of Midland at the time. Very same time. What is the function of an interim president? How did you conceive the role? Uh, to keep the church in the middle of the town. Okay. Uh, you know, Until you could find a new permanent right. president. And at the same time, search for a new president, and it was Father O'Hoff that we finally uh, How did it go those months? Did, did things go pretty no, smoothly? Very well. I, uh, I immediately met with each of the vice presidents. Uh, this all wouldn't have happened if, if we didn't have tremendous vice presidents. Um, and John Kusha was fantastic. Uh, Richard Hurt, John Kusha is to this day uh, uh, Just the executive vice president yeah. or administrative, yeah, yeah perhaps. Right, that's right. Yeah. And uh, Richard Erte was another who's now a professor, but was the financial vice president. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all terrific people. And uh, I, my office was downtown, my corporate office, and uh, it was 90 and in the fall, and classes were back underway. And John Kusha called me one day and said, Mike, the BASF chemical factory, which was up here at the corner. Mm -hmm. Or was, up, yeah. Was. Right. right at the corner of Dana, Dana and Montgomery. And it literally blew up. It blew up. And yeah. He said there's smoke all over black smoke and burning embers were on Hussman Hall and the blew the windows out of the library and the back of the library. And so uh, I made a presidential decision. I said, John, evacuate the campus. And you know what John said to me? What? I already have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My big yeah, that's the one decision you <laughs> had to make. Right. It had already right. been made. Yeah. But I'd come out, you know, noon and sometimes during the day, mm -hmm. uh, a few weekends. And, but it, it really went very well. And of course, your big task was finding a new president. Absolutely. That, w that was, uh, and. Um, I put and a letter out to the other 27 Jesuit university presidents uh, in the nine other provinces asking for recommendations and we got a few and, and uh, a number recommending Father Jim Hoff, mm -hmm. who was at Creighton University, had been there 17 years before. And he was he president of development there, or vice president of, vice development, president of development at Creighton in Omaha, Nebraska. President of Creighton Foundation. Okay. He also was uh, two or three years uh, uh, in charge of the hospital, or the president of the hospital mm -hmm. at Creighton. They had a big med school, yeah, still yeah, have it. That's right. Yeah, yes. yeah. So with those recommendations, and uh, strong recommendations from Father Lavelle, who was president of John Carroll. Oh, Father Michael Lavelle, right. yes. Who was on our board at the time. Who was on our board. Yes, yeah. Um, so I contacted Father Hoff and said that, you know, getting a lot of recommends for you, uh, can we come visit? And he said, no, I'm not interested. Uh, uh, and I said, well, you know, we don't have to do it on campus. And he said, no. Nope. You know. So that was that. Father Mike Lavelle kept telling me, you know, try him again. So I called him again and said, how about coming to Cincinnati? You know, you don't have to come to campus. He didn't want to go through all the interviews and all that. He had just been candidate for the position in Marquette. Wasn't that Father part of Diulio, the complicating? He and Father Diulio were the two finalists, were the two finalists. at Marquette. Yes, and Father Diulio got it. And, um, you know, he didn't want to even. I, he didn't want to go through that whole thing no. again. Right. No. no, but when I asked him to come on to Cincinnati and, you know, we can do it away from campus, and he got the same answer. No, he, he wasn't interested. Long story short, I tried him one more time and said, how about if we meet in Chicago at the hotel at the O'Hare Airport? You know, I'll get a room, conference room, and then, and uh, he said, all right, I'll do that. So there were five of us, I believe, that flew to Chicago and met with him. And the first half hour, you know, we're meeting and we broke, took a little break, and he left the room. I said to the folks that <laughs> I was with, I said, you know, we're here to interview him. And do you realize that he spent a half an hour interviewing us? <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, right off the bat, he was perfect. He was- You knew you had the right Oh, man. gosh, yes, gosh, yes. So he finally said, yeah, I'll pray over it. 
residential. He was uh, the Wisconsin province, not the Chicago province. And uh, long story short, he, he agreed to come, mm -hmm. which was, that's when Xavier really took off. Yes, I think that, that that's Big, really big time. Yes. I'd like to talk about Father Jim Hoff a bit because he was more than just a colleague. He was a close personal friend of yours. Very much so. And uh, what was he like? What, what kind of person was he? Warm. I mean, the, the kind of person that even in a crowd when he's talking to you, uh, whoever that might be, that person felt that <laughs> they were the only one in the room with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. He just had that, that charisma. Mm -hmm. Terrific with the students. Mm -hmm. um, really uh, building grounds-wise, he, mm -hmm. he really uh, mm -hmm. put this place up. He was a skilled administrator, too. He was, was very. He, uh, very you think of the, the buildings that he put up, uh, the Sinta Center, uh, the Gallagher Center, um, I think the, uh, the, the Commons. Banger. Banger. The Banger yes. dorm and the, the Commons. That's right, the Commons. That dorm. Renovated these buildings along the, the yeah. west side of the mall, or this building included. That's right. He did or not. And this quite a fun, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, this was the library when I was in school. Mm -hmm. and then it became a learning lab at one time, but um, we have, we have, and he, he is the one that put this together. We have 50 chapters, alumni chapters around the country and in the Far East there are a couple. Um, we have an annual meeting where the presidents of all the chapters come. And uh, it was with him, we were in here, and, and a couple of them were talking to him, and uh, they said, holy criminy, what, what was this room uh, when I was in school? And he says, it was the library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want your diplomas back. <laughs> he said that proves he to said, me you were never in the library. Right, right. Yes, that, that, you just uh, indicted yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's but right. that's true. His work organizing the uh, National Alumni Association was, was extensive. He spent well, a fair amount of time, time doing that. Yeah. 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 And the reason, one of the main reasons that, that we were able to build all these new buildings and, and form the malls and the whole works was the development effort mm -hmm. and he was an expert at that really very good um, wasn't bashful but made the asks in a in a very personal way and uh, and we were very successful uh, which was one of the reasons that we expanded the board we have 39 members on the board now mm -hmm. and uh, we just don't know we just don't want people that can give uh, we were very careful about the diversity of the board, mm -hmm. um, and we need help in identifying those others that can give, and that's one of the obligations of a board mm -hmm. member. Sure, not only can give, but will well and solicit other gifts, I suppose, right. too. Yes. Right, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He was an extraordinary fundraiser. Very much so. Yeah. I got a little example of that. When Nance and I were to be married, and we sent invitations out, and uh, on the invitation it said, please no gifts. Um, and a good friend of mine, uh, Jack Brown, I served on his board for 20 some years, <coughs> Burke International Research, um, and he knew Father Hoff well. Well, Jack Brown called Jim, Father Hoff, and said, you know, I've known Mike for a long time, and uh, he was verbose and complimenting me, and I was a mentor to him and all that good stuff. And, and Jack said to Father Hoff, you know, I want to give Xavier University $25,000 in his honor. You know what Jim said to him? No. He said, you just told me what a wonderful person he was and how he's helped you. Isn't he worth more than that? <laughs> He wanted to, him to up that <laughs> yeah, gift. That's right. <laughs> Double it. They said of him he had the nerve of a burglar when yeah. it came to asking for money. But subliminally so. Yeah, yes, yes, but very clever. He, did, he didn't want to bend in and carry a gun. He <laughs> but he achieved his But goal. he could pick your pocket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned about the James Hoff, and so he would be one example of it. But as you look back over years and say, who were the people, in your opinion, had the greatest influence growth and success over the years. I guess we've already mentioned a number of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I go immediately back to Father O'Connor. 
Um, and Father Monaghan uh, was really good. He served, he was president for 10 years mm -hmm. uh, for the Kurdish, a shorter period of time. And Father Meanporty, whom you mentioned earlier, uh, he was Father O'Connor's right hand man yes, he was. and really in, got involved in, in the construction of, of the buildings around here. Right. The scene. And Father J. Peter Bushman, I'm sure you remember Father him Bushman, very, yeah. very well. Yeah. Ran admissions very, right. very well for many years. And That's were, right. Those would be some people. Father As you Nipo look, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, uh, Father Nipoti and I served on the athletic board. And uh, Father uh, Mulligan called me, and he, he would appoint the athletic board each year. And he called me uh, at the end of the, the year and said, Mike, I don't think it's a good idea that you, know, you as a trustee uh, serve on the, uh, on the athletic board. There might be a conflict of interest or whatever. And I said, <coughs> you know, I really don't see that and I don't agree with that. And uh, he said, well, I, I think it's going to be best uh, that, you, that I don't reappoint you to the athletic board. And I said, uh, what about Father Nipoti? There was dead silence. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, Father Nip I run into Father Nipoti. He said, what did you do? I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, Father Mulligan is not going to appoint me for, to the board. The athletic board. The athletic oh. board again. Yeah. Well, fair is fair. Fair is fair, that's <laughs> right. And, and be Consistent. That's right. Yeah, and so uh, yeah, off he went <laughs> in the board. Yeah. As you look back, what are your fondest memories of Zeta? The Jesuits and, and, and what they stand for and Xavier itself. I mean, it's just uh, mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. Uh, they were a tremendous influence on my life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for others? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I got out of the Marine Corps, I thought, you know, I, I need a, a mission statement in my life. and. Uh, and I thought about it, and, and so I put a very simple statement on, on paper, mm -hmm. uh, which I have typed. I have it in my office, and I have it at home. <laughs> uh, and you recognize part of it anyway. Uh, my mission statement has been to be a person for others who doesn't give in to himself. Does not give in to himself. Right. Mm -hmm. First part isn't as difficult as the second part, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they really go together. Mm -hmm. And you know, example of, of my influence, of your your order's influence on me. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Well, that's a high compliment. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, How has Xavier's commitment to its Catholic Jesuit ideals changed over the years? And in what way has it remained the same? It's been strong. It's it's been very strong. Um, I'm on the board of the Antonium, uh, the seminary. Which here. is the seminary? Yeah, yes. and. Uh, the Archbishop uh, chairs that board, so I've gotten to know the Archbishop very well. It's been Dan Florchek the whole time until now. He's retiring, mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, every time we change our president, uh, we'd go down and call Archbishop Florchek. We'd go down and meet him. And, uh, so there's a real strong relationship mm -hmm. uh, with this archdiocese, you know, with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Um, at one point, I forget who, I think it was Father Mike, Father Graham. We went down to see, uh, see Archbishop Kolarczyk and uh, you know, the introduction and pledge support and, and all those good things. And the Archbishop says, you know, I, I read all your material and you talk about uh, the Jesuit university. He said, you seldom mention Catholic in that. And if you'll notice now, oh, we always talk about the Jesuit Catholic University. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, as far as influence is concerned, that's the only influence mm -hmm. uh, that I've experienced uh, from downtown, from the Archbishop. Mm -hmm. And it was done kind of in a joking way, but mm -hmm. you know, the message mm -hmm. was clear. clear. Yeah, and yeah. it's probably something we should be conscious of, too. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. I think. You, of course, uh, came to Zay at the time when the core for the government and the 
emphasis on the, on the liberal arts was very, very strong. How has that served you in your career? As you look back on your undergraduate education, are you satisfied with what you got? Absolutely, and the core curriculum is key. We still have the core curriculum. It's been nuanced a bit. Uh, it's absolutely necessary. You know, the business world is interested in hiring liberal arts grads mm -hmm. that have that kind of core background. Mm -hmm. um, an executive residence in the business college, and we meet with the freshman business students one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, uh, each year in the second semester. Is this that mentoring program, Mike, that they talk about, uh, this or is, is this something different? No, then the mentoring program is, goes beyond that. I see, okay. This is just, there are six or seven of us that are executives and residents, and we split up the... The freshman class? The freshman class, right. and we spend a half an hour, 45 minutes, one-on-one -on -one oh, with them. Oh, that's yeah. And, uh, and I tell them, and I, and I absolutely believe this, that core curriculum is so important. Um, I mean, it teaches you to think, read, write. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I tell them, I said, you know, you graduate from Xavier University, mm -hmm. you can do anything you want in life except brain surgery because it really prepares you so well. Mm -hmm. And for the business world, just like you any other, other possible anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very, very strong presence. Right, yeah. As you look back, are there any regrets? Any unfulfilled dreams as far as Xavier is concerned? Or things you might do differently or wish it had done differently? Maybe football was one. Maybe him. I'd like to see that still here, but mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, there, there really isn't. I, it's, it's just a very solid educational institution mm -hmm. that provides all kinds of wonderful extracurricular things for our students. Um, and from Father O'Connor or Father McGuire when I was here on, oh, and, there's, and, there's, and, and it's the Jesuit philosophy thread throughout that really serves it so well. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, it really took off uh, when Jim, Father Hoff, mm -hmm. became president. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's even a step up from there with Father Mike Father Graham. Michael Graham are, he is yeah. doing a magnificent mm -hmm. job. Yes, we're very fortunate to have both of them. Absolutely. Yeah, very much so. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to add, right, uh, that we, we haven't covered? Any story you'd like to, to tell, or, mm -hmm. or have we covered most of the topics pretty well? I think we have. Uh, Father Hawk, Jim, when I was elected president of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick, and you're president for one year, and the banquet is the big focal point, you know. 700 men there in tuxes and uh, but when you're president you you uh, appoint the chaplain and the speaker uh, for the banquet well chaplain for the year so I called Jim uh, further off and I said I just got elected president of friendly sons he and I would go back and forth about the Irish and the Germans and all that all the time so I just was elected president of friendly sons and I'd like for you to be my chaplain. And he gives me a, <laughs> a shot. And he said, all right, what, what's it entail? And I said, well, you know, you will say something at the dinner and that type of thing. But yeah, he's a chaplain for the year. I said, now you have to put that on, on your letterhead. You know, president and chaplain. Favorite friendly. university president, <laughs> chaplain of the friendly <laughs> said to me. What? What order would you like that in? <laughs> I said, you're an Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good story. Then, yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Not really. I, I, I thank you for this opportunity. I, I thank the Jesuits in this university for providing me the opportunity to uh, be part of the process. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I think I have one thing I'd like to add, <laughs> if, if I may. And this is just for the record. Right now, year 2009, we're putting up a new building here on campus, the Learning Commons. And in about a year, it'll be finished and it will be dedicated. And I understand the board has decided to name it the Connaughton Learning Commons. 
and I think that's neat. Fitting tribute to a man who's done an awful lot for Xavier University it's, it's, and about as good a friend as Xavier's ever had. Well, it's, it's fantastic and, uh, and very humbling. Mm -hmm. Richly deserved, however. Oh, yeah. thank you for that. Good. <laughs> I think this concludes our interview then, and I want to thank uh, Mike Connaughton once again for coming today. This has been an interesting discussion. I've enjoyed it, and hope you have as well. I have as well. God bless you. Thanks. God bless you, Father. Thanks.